Hello and welcome to another episode of EKU Online's eCast series. EKU Online's mission is to change lives by providing access to affordable and high quality degree programs in meaningful disciplines that positively impact our society. We thank you for joining us today. Today we are joined by Michael Four, assistant professor in the College of Business and a practicing attorney. Professor Four was born in Richmond, Kentucky and graduated from Model Laboratory High School. He continued his education, graduating from Tulane University in 1999 with degrees in both political science and history. In 2002, he obtained his Juris Doctor from Wake Forest University School of Law, and he was admitted to the Kentucky Bar in 2002 and to the U.S. District Court of, for the Eastern District of Kentucky in 2003. Professor Four's legal practice focuses on civil litigation, contract disputes, business law, estates, and insurance disputes. He's a past president of the Madison County Bar Association and has worked with various community organizations and nonprofit causes. So welcome, Professor Four. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate you being here with us. Well, thank you for having me, Sam. I appreciate it. I, I think a lot of the work that eCampus does, and it's always a pleasure to work with you guys. Well, likewise. Um, as we get started here today, Professor Four, just please share with us a little bit about the courses that you teach for the College of Business. Um, tell us how you manage to kind of juggle a thriving and no doubt very pra uh, busy practice uh, with teaching as well. Well, the two courses that I teach uh, through eCampus and at regular campus are, first of all, GBU 204, the legal environment of business. It'll be the designation will be switching to Business 204 uh, for the fall semester, but it's the same course. It's a law survey class that's required of all undergraduate uh, folks in the business program. Um, the other class I get to teach is Accounting 440, which is accounting law, uh, and that class is designed to be sort of a uh, prep course for um, accountants who are Plan, accounting students who plan to take the CPA, it's focused towards the business law sections of uh, the CPA exam. So um, in terms of balancing things, you know, you, you read my practice areas and I'm probably the luckiest guy you'll ever get to talk to. I mean, I love to practice law, but I love more to teach and I'm lucky enough to be able to teach kind of what I do when I'm not in the classroom. And so there's so much overlap between the real world problems I help folks with at my practice and then the uh, academic problems and the knowledge that we're trying to give to folks who take the classes. Um, it's really a pretty easy transition. There's a lot of time management involved, but um, frankly, my doing a little bit of practice still really informs my teaching a lot. And um, for both classes, uh, particularly for, for Business 204, you know, my focus is always on practical knowledge. Um, as a lawyer, most of the time when I meet people, it's because they have a problem. And they, it, it, teaching, you get to be on the other side of that equation. And what I want to do is give students information that they can have so they, they don't wind up with those problems. And so the, the two things sort of feed on each other. And it's, it's a, I'm just very fortunate to be able to do that. I'd imagine uh, as a student, having a professor who's also a practicing professional uh, in, in law, I mean, as far as that goes, that's also a uh, kind of a benefit for them as well, seeing you still in the field there having practicing experience. Well, I hope so. And, and I think it is, it's certainly, um, keeps me current on what the issues folks are seeing and the trends we see, whether it's in business formations or any other aspect of the law. Um, you know, I'll give you some examples. The way businesses use arbitration agreements or methods other than litigation to solve problems, those things are constantly changing. Um, the contract law, the trends that we see in how businesses contract, um, you know, I see that and then can can pass that right to the classroom, that sort of practical knowledge. You know, this past year, um, we had a, a good example of that in 2020. Of course, everything was unique and we dealt with things we hadn't dealt with before. And the big issue in business contract law were these what are called force majeure clauses or um, 
a clause that basically says in a contract that when an act of God happens or something that's totally unforeseen, the deal is off and we can set aside the contract. Well, those had been just an academic exercise up until 2020, but that became the hot topic in real world contract law. And I was able to pass that along to the classroom as I sort of saw how courts developed with that. Uh, I don't know if that's wrong place, wrong time, or right place, wrong time, or right place, right time. <laughs> wrong, wrong place, but bad time, perhaps for all of us. But, but you know, there is a lot to. Be, there's a lot that I enjoy about being able to stay relevant on both points, and I think that does help students. Absolutely, your courses seem to center around the legal and ethical aspects of business. Um, and considering that these are rather broad topics, what do you focus on with your students? And are there particular legal or ethical matters that really need the attention uh, of your students? Well, you know, in terms of ethics, business ethics is a foundational thing that you've got to have if you're going to succeed. And you also have to have as part of an education at Eastern. We, we don't want folks to leave here without that foundation and that mooring for where whatever challenges they face in life. Um, in terms of the law that folks need to know, I approach it very much from a practical standpoint. I know what people need to know uh, and what, they, what the problems are when they don't know those things. Uh, so many of top of the topics we deal with in class, I'll talk about the importance of issue spotting. Nobody can know all the answers to all the laws in the world. But if as a business person or a lawyer or an undergraduate student, if you know when to look for help and when to ask questions and the cues that are out there that say, gosh, this is a potential problem or this is something I need to think about. If you can do that in terms of legal issues and you know when to ask for help and when to be cautious, um, that can keep you out of an awful lot of trouble in life and in school and in whatever. And so that sort of practical approach is really the, the foundation of the way I approach things. Fantastic. Uh, Professor Ford, you have, a, you have a reputation as being a highly engaging and creative instructor. Um, could you share with our audience a little bit about your approach to online teaching as it differs from, you know, maybe your on-campus uh, modality and then some of the tools you use to enhance the learning experience? Yeah, it, it is a really different experience. Um, you know, I start with the learning goals. What do the kids need to know? What do our students need to take away to succeed wherever they go? Um, online learning is a different world and it requires some different approaches. It requires in some ways more of our students uh, than an in-person class. My in-person classes are, are very different from the online experience. In person, I will go and I'll lecture and I'll talk and I'll tell stories and people can listen and they'll ask questions and we have a talk and that's the, that's the class. And nobody wants to watch a uh, hour long Zoom session or an hour long YouTube video of me chattering away. So you've got to figure out different ways to, to deliver the same content and get folks to the same learning goal. Um, I, I've tried a lot of different things. And my advice uh, as a starting point for any instructor that's moving into online would be to take the PD2 camp, uh, class through eCampus. Um, you know, I got involved in online education, I guess maybe three years ago uh, when I first started doing this and I entered it, you know, I was a middle-aged person who'd never taken an online class or conceived of having an online class. For me, my classroom experience was in person. You sit in the room, you take notes, you get tested on it. And that PD2 course really gave me an idea of, okay, here's what the student experience is going to be like. Um, in terms of constructing my classes, I've tried to use different media, be it um, video, short videos, short. We don't want anybody to, to have to sit in front of a screen any longer than they have to. Um, short videos, PowerPoints where appropriate, different kinds of exercises, different kinds of activities, discussion boards where they fit, just different tools to try to keep people engaged because it it really does require in a lot of ways more work to succeed in the online environment and then probably more work still to leave with the knowledge base 
that's equivalent of, of where we want it to be. So there's a lot more on the student. And I think you want to try to make that a varied and as engaging an experience as you can. Um, there's a lot of other approaches that I've tried to do, but I think at the end of the day, that's that's the key is to try to find different things to do to keep folks engaged. It's really interesting to hear faculty say the, you know, the time management issue, because we we, we see that many times with our, with our veteran teachers mm -hmm. who've been teaching on campus for 30 years. It's like, it's a whole different approach, uh, not just for the student, it requires more organization and, and planning, but, but even for the faculty yeah. as well. And, and I'll tell you, as faculty, you know, it's, there's good and bad parts to it, but the teaching part, the work on my part for an online course is really done in, it's kind of in the off season. It's before the class gets geared up. You've got to build that experience, what it's going to be week to week or day to day where people will stay engaged. Um, Whereas if you're in person, you know, it's it's a day to day process, you know, where did we leave off? What do we need to address? Where do we go the next day? Um, during the course of the semester, you know, my focus is giving kids good feedback promptly. I think we all expect when we do things online, whether it's I'm ordering from Amazon or <laughs> I'm uh, sending, you know, somebody an email, we like that quick feedback. And to the extent we can give quality feedback and do it quickly, I think we try to focus on that and then keep engaged with students. You know, I, I love getting student emails or when people post and they say, hey, I've got a question in the virtual office. I, I'm thrilled by that because that's somebody who's engaged and they want to know more. And gosh, that's what I'm here for is to try to give them that more, whatever that more is. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, on that note, with the program completely online, what do the demographics of your student population look like? Uh, what kind of students is the program and in particular your courses uh, attracting? And then what kind of students seem to find success in your courses? Well, as to the last part, I think anybody can succeed in the course and in whichever course I have, it, you can succeed there. It's going to be a function of putting in the work and following the instructions and doing the activities that are there. Um, same thing with an in-person course. If you put forth C-level effort and, you know, you count your points and you get to that threshold and then you check out, you're going to have a C-level result. But if you want to succeed, you're going to be able to. Um, the, that effort is on you. Um, now, the first part of your question, give me that again, and I'll, I've kind of lost track of. It was a, it was a lot to that question. With with the program completely online, what do the demographics oh, of your students? Type of type of students, yeah, um, it's different. Uh, the first few years I taught online, online learners were traditionally going to be folks that had a career, that perhaps had come back to get an accounting certificate or they were finishing up that undergraduate degree that they were a few credits away from. Um, and those were a lot of students who, many of them already had good time management skills because they managed their career or their family, um, their regular life. Um, since of course, 2020, we've seen a little shift in that. And there's a lot more traditional undergraduate type students there who have perhaps the advantage of their not having to juggle some of those things, but they have the disadvantage of not having that experience in the time management. And online courses, no matter how you structure them, you've got to be willing, if you want to succeed at them, you have to budget the time to work and you've got to budget the time to do whatever that learning expectation is, you've got to put in the work. And so it, it's been different. And I think this, um, this summer course, the summer one courses that I have now is really, this is really the first semester where I've had sort of an, what I perceive is kind of an even mix between those two groups of the traditional undergrad students. And then there's still a good chunk of folks that are maybe the more traditional online learners. But I, you know, my guess is that in the future, that line's only going to blur as we go forward because online's here for everybody. You can't deny the advantages of it. 
Yeah, I think that's we're starting to just now see the the silver linings of this past year that we've had, and 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 the hybridization of of this mm. approach is uh, is like you said. I think we're going to see more and more of that, which which seems like it's a good thing ultimately. I I, I think so, and and you know I um I remember taking that PDT PD two course within uh, Provost Vice, and she talked about how she was a high touch individual. She was the kind of person who wanted to shake your hand and look you in the eye and get to know you. And I'm kind of like that too. Um, it, it is a transition to move online, but the world that we're in, we've got to be able to do it. And I, you know, I think about the examples of many of the online students I've had. Traditionally, you know, that when they introduce themselves, or you talk to them or you interact with them on discussion boards, you find out these are folks who are perhaps not traditional Eastern students. They come to us from all over the country and all over the world. And that's pretty neat to be able, first of all, to deliver an EKU education to those folks, but also to let those folks be part of Eastern's community of learning and the neat and the diverse and the different experiences um, that we get from that is really fantastic. And, and I think the, you know, like you say, online's here to stay. And we've got to find out ways to succeed at this. Um, I think that probably the technology is going to change. I can't imagine in 10 years from now, we'll still be using Blackboard, but maybe we will. I don't know. Um, but there's good, you know, maybe we'll have holograms or something we can lecture on. I don't, I don't know what the world will hold, but um, I, I think it's a pretty neat time to be in online learning. As a practicing attorney and a professor, what is it that you want your students to really come away with in your courses? I mean, what do you want them to remember 10 years from now on when they're faced with an ethical challenge? Well, for an, an ethical challenge, I mean, they've got to find their personal moral compass. Um, that's and that's something probably that they've got before long before they ever get to me. Uh, if we raise the awareness of those kinds of issues, if in taking a business ethics class, they get to consider and do maybe a, a real good critical thinking analysis of an ethics issue, those are really good repetitions and practice. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes, not have to make our own. And it, it, to the extent that we can give that experience to students, I think in terms of the ethics component, that that's the real good takeaway is that we want students to have awareness of ethical issues, um, to know that, it, you know, sometimes it's okay to say no, or it's okay to, to go a different course that they've got to be conscious of it because that that awareness of ethics, um, you know, for many years, uh, Dr. Judy Spain taught the same course that that I now do. And she did this a great program ethics awareness week. And I think that's a great way to think about ethics issues is that we, we do want that awareness. You know, you can't prepare everybody. Here's always the right answer to an ethical problem or here's, here's the tool that's going to get you out of it. But if we can get students to be more aware when they go on with their careers of, of ethical challenges and how to confront them, I think that's the, that's the only tool you can really give folks. That's a great, a great answer. If you had to give an elevator pitch to a handful of business students uh, and you had 30, about 30 seconds to tell them why they should take your courses, what in essence do you say to those students? The elevator pitch is, I think, and this is an easy one for me, everybody knows that the law is going to shape the environment of business they're in. And they, the basics of the legal knowledge that they're going to need, that's what they're going to get. They're going to know when to stay out of trouble, what to be aware of, when to spot those issues where they need to maybe call a lawyer or ask for help. Um, that's what they're going to get. Now, the, the perhaps easier answer for my course is that Business 204 or GBU 204, as it's been called before, is a prerequisite for all these business programs. So they really don't have a choice. I don't have to pitch people very often. Um, they're, they're there, and that's a great thing. I'm happy to have them. I, I wish, wish I could teach more kids every semester. What do you see some of the leading causes to be of those who get caught up in unethical and even illegal behaviors in business? I mean, are there trends there or is it just simple greed that, that bursts these actions? Or do you think there's more to it than that? Gosh, that's, that's probably too, um, you know, it's probably not a simple answer to that. Why do people do bad things? Why do people do things that 
that when you look at it in retrospect, you go, oh my gosh, what a terrible behavior. Why would someone do that? Um, I think greed, all the human vices that drive people and historically have driven people to do bad things or to do things that we look back and consider immoral, uh, those are true in the business world the same way they are in people's personal lives or or wherever. I mean, it's, it's the same motivations. Um, I think that, you know, you can talk about and, and we could write, uh, destroy forests, writing books about the causes of ethical failures. Um, in some cases, it's, you know, a product of groupthink where you have a culture that embraces that. Uh, one of the things that I've that we've tried to do in some of our recent ethics writings as part of the course is ask students, hey, do you think that what do you think the cause is of this situation? And sometimes it's a perhaps a legal problem, something the law allows to happen, but is we could all agree unethical. I think a good example of that or, or you know, at least not ideal, would be phar pharmaceutical price rises. You've heard accounts in the news of whether it's EpiPens or uh, the um, pharmaceutical companies that will raise their prices because they essentially control the market for a drug. That's perfectly legal, but it's probably not the best um, social practice. Um, some things are structural problems, maybe in an organization. You think about Wells Fargo giving incentives to their bankers to open dozens and dozens of checking accounts that people didn't need. You know, that's, a, that's kind of a, a problem with the way that company was structured and their incentives. Um, and then you go back to the, to the original point that some things are just, they're bad people doing bad things. And so I think we've got to be conscious of, of all of the different ways you get there. The landscape now too also, and I think we, we try to impart this on students that it, it's much easier to catch people doing bad things now with just the way the world is. It, it, it probably is. There's certainly a lot more awareness in the world. Um, you know, one of the tests that uh, a scholar, uh, Laura Nash has proposed for, is this an ethical behavior is the question of, well, if, if there was a story on the front page of the newspaper about you, and this is what you did, would you be happy for your neighbors and friends to, to read that newspaper? And if the answer is no, perhaps you should rethink your course of action. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good test for a lot of things, right? I would say that's one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, that, that's a yeah. good way of looking at it. <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, as you work with a myriad of students with diverse backgrounds and experiences, are you encouraged or discouraged uh, in what the future holds for the world of business? Oh, I would say I'm definitely encouraged. Um, students are, you know, in terms of the technology piece, students are far uh, more sophisticated about what they can do um, online and the way to use these online technologies to, um, to in their education and then also for business. I think folks are generally more tech ready. Um, I think there's also encouragement that uh, so many of the students we see in the business school have a great motivation, uh, a lot of self-motivation. And, you know, it's always encouraging for me as a faculty member um, to, to just to get to talk to, to our kids and see where they come from and where they want to go. We've got so many great stories here at EKU. Uh, and the best kids at EKU could go against the best kids at any school in the country. Um, they really are top notch and, and it's just so encouraging to see um, to see the places where you know our recent graduates go. I, I think I'm, I'm very encouraged for the future business world. We have some amazing students um, at EKU, that's for sure. Professor Four, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I would encourage anybody, I, you know, uh, the GBU 204 class or the Business 204 class is usually full, but um, I would say if there's anybody from outside of the business school who wants to take it, I would encourage them to, because it's you. It's really a law survey course, and I'd love to see folks, and we do see a handful of folks from across campus in there. Um, it's great to get that foundation, and I think wherever you go, that course is going to be a benefit to you. Um, 
but uh, you know, and for folks who are not familiar with EKUZ campus, I would just pitch the resources that you guys have there in terms of assisting educators and students um, through online learning, because you really do some neat stuff. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Ford. It's been great getting to talk to you on this uh, very strange rainy uh, day we're having here in, in, yes. in Kentucky. Um, but it's been great getting to know you a little better. And we, we do appreciate your time and your commitment to our students here at EKU. Like, uh, oh, Well, I'm happy to be here. It's, EKU is a great place. And uh, it, being able to teach is, is really incredibly rewarding. I mean, uh, the old cliche about changing lives, that stuff is really true. It's true. And the the students that I've seen go through here, I mean, it's um, been just a remarkable experience for me. It's really, really treasure it. Well, we we know your students appreciate you because we read the reviews, but we we appreciate you as well. So thank you again for your time today. Thank you.